You are listening to the Through the Bible Studio Series with Pastor Nate Holdridge. Join us as we continue our study through the Old Testament book of Proverbs. Here's Nate. Proverbs 27, verse 1 says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. Now, Proverbs like this are not anti planning. In other words, the Proverbs are filled with insights that encourage us to use our minds, to use our reason, and to plan and prepare for the future. Uh, We are to emulate the ant who stores up and prepares and works hard today so that his tomorrow can be successful. No, the idea of not boasting about tomorrow is not that we would refuse to prepare for tomorrow, but that we would understand the uncertainty of tomorrow. That's the concept. He says, for you do not know what a day may bring. Uh, The proverb is not anti-planning, but it is anti-pride. You see, to say that we know what tomorrow will bring makes us equal to God. For only God has certainty about the future, for he lives outside of time and space. So when we take an attitude like this and believe that we know exactly what will come in the future, that it is certain and secure, we are proudfully, boastfully equating ourselves with at least an attribute that is exclusive to the Godhead. Instead, we should have a humility. James said it this way in James chapter 4, verse 13. He said, come now you who say today or tomorrow will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. For what is your life, James writes, for you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Now, in that exhortation, James gives us the appropriate attitude. We would say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. So planning, but also understanding, we do not know exactly what will unfold. Verse 2, let another praise you and not your own mouth a stranger, and not your own lips. To praise yourself is evidence, basically, that you have not allowed the gospel to do its deep work on your heart. It really does seem that a true understanding of the gospel message destroys all human tendency to boast. Paul said in Romans 3, verse 27, after declaring briefly the glorious gospel on the backdrop of a broken and depraved humanity in Romans 1 through 3. He said in verse 27 of Romans 3, then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. In other words, the gospel believer understands that they cannot boast in themselves uh, because it is all of grace. It is all of the Lord. Now here in this proverb, the idea is that we ought to instead let another praise us, strangers, not our own lips. Now this is great advice to keep close to the heart uh, whenever using modern means of communication. Uh, So often we as human beings love to fish for praise. We love to try to get others to celebrate the work that we have done. But instead, we need to make sure that we're just, you know, keeping ourselves away from that and that we would just say, you know, I'm not going to praise myself. I'm not even going to fish for praise I'm just going to, if someone sees something that is worthy of celebration, I'm just going to let them do it on their own rather than trying to prompt or preempt them. Verse 3, a stone is heavy and sand is weighty, but a fool's provocation is heavier than both. Now, sometimes it's helpful in the Proverbs to look at various translations. And one very creative translation is, 
Eugene Peterson's The Message translation, and he translated it this way, carrying a log across your shoulders while you're hefting a boulder with your arms is nothing compared to the burden of putting up with a fool. The idea here is that physical fatigue is painful, a stone or carrying a bag of sand, but it's nothing compared to the mental and spiritual fatigue that exists from dealing with a fool. It's exhausting work to carry stones and exhausting work to carry sand, but it is more wearying and painful to deal with the fool. I, I think that this proverb is good for us to remember as we just navigate human life. And for this reason, remember how exhausted many of the people in your life are. Because many of the people that are in your life, they are forced to, it's not their choice, but they are forced to deal with folly. And to deal with folly, it can be physically, but also mentally and spiritually taxing. And as we remember that, perhaps we'll extend a little more grace to those around us. Wrath, verse 4, is cruel. Anger is overwhelming. But who can stand before jealousy? In other words, wrath and anger are hard to deal with because they're cruel and they're overwhelming. But the proverb paints jealousy as harsher than both. Jealousy is harsher than wrath. Jealousy is harsher than anger. A great example of this would be David who suffered under the jealousy of Saul. That jealousy turned into wrath. That jealousy turned into anger. In a sense, this jealousy is what put Jesus upon the cross because the envy of the religious leaders drove them to desire his death. It says in Matthew 27, verse 18, that Pontius Pilate knew that it was out of envy that they have, had delivered Jesus up to him. Verse 5, better is open rebuke than hidden love. Now, here, love actually leads to open rebuke at times. That's the idea here. Open rebuke versus hidden love. In other words, Good love, healthy love, will at times lead to an open rebuke. You know, the idea there is that we want to be open with our love for others. Uh, this stands as a great proverb for, I think, leaders, spouses, employers, parents, and anyone else responsible for other people. We cannot keep our corrections quiet and silent. It's fascinating to me how easy it is to offer a rebuke of someone else to someone else rather than to the person that should hear it and receive it. But on the flip side, we should make sure that we are giving open approval as well. Faithful, verse 6, are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Now, this is a similar idea to the previous proverb. Uh, we should not be deceived into thinking that those who only speak kindly to us are our friends. No, those who challenge us are oftentimes our friends. And so we must consider who is around us. Are these people that are going to challenge us and grow us? Or are we only surrounding ourselves with people who will say the kind things to us? And do we think that anyone who challenges us is an enemy? One reason that people give sometimes for refusing to attend church gatherings is that they say, I feel judged. And the truth is, without a doubt, that is a reality in hypercritical churches. But often, a person is not experiencing hyper-criticism, but healthy conviction when they gather together with the body of Christ. And perhaps the very thing that is needed in their lives is a little examination. Because through examination, we get to where God wants to take us. You have to pause from time to time and ask the question, how am I doing before the Lord? Verse 7 
One who is full loathes honey, but to one who is hungry, everything bitter is sweet. Now, this proverb stands as a great weapon against temptation that we are going to come across in life. In other words, uh, the way that you s combat temptation is to be full. You know, the one who is full loathes honey. If, if they're already full, they're not going to eat the honey. But if they're hungry, then everything bitter is sweet. They tend to settle for less than the best because they have hunger in their lives. Unfortunately, you can easily see this happening all throughout humanity. And unfortunately, it happens often in the church. For example, someone is single, they want to be married, and because of their singleness, they're not satisfied with being alone, and so they begin to be hungry for anyone that can satisfy, it, even in a minor degree, their feelings of loneliness. Instead, it would be better to be full, therefore you would not enter into temptation to settle for someone that you should not engage with. You must fill yourself. But what do you fill yourself with? Well, we must fill ourselves with God. Consider how Jesus combated temptation. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He said, it's written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. The more that you're able to say, there is more to me than just what is physical. I am satisfied with God's word. The more you're able to say, he is the only one for me, the only one that I should serve. And the more you're able to say, he's been good to me, therefore I do not need to put him to the test, the more you will be satisfied with him. And when you're satisfied with him, you will loathe the temptations because you are satisfied with the Lord. Verse 8, like a bird that strays from its nest is a man who strays from his home. Now, this man described in this proverb is no man at all, for he neglects his duty. That's what's happening here. He strays from his home like a bird that strays from its nest. And so this man is rebuked. He is not praised because he's neglected his home. He's neglected his duty. Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 5 verse 8, Of the men in the church, if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Now these are stern words that serve as a warning to our modern generation that we should remain within our home, that we should take care of our duties. And too many men have strayed from their nest. I've seen many Christian men who have adopted so many hobbies and so many interests that keep them away from their home. But you must be a home-bound man if you are going to marry and raise children. You must delight in your bride. You must delight in your children and put your focus as much as you can. You, of course, will need to work. You will, of course, need to earn a living and provide. But... When you stray from your home in these other areas of life, you are inviting disaster into that environment. Verse 9, oil and perfume make the heart glad, and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. Uh, here, the proverb is very basic. Earnest counsel from a friend is like oil and perfume's effect. It makes the heart glad. You know, when you receive good, earnest counsel from a friend, it just delights the soul. Verse 10, do not forsake your friend and your father's friend, and do not go to your brother's house in the day of your calamity. Better is a neighbor who is near than a brother who is far away. Now, normally in the Proverbs, we'd have statements like this. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Proverbs 17, verse 17. But this proverb seems to exalt close by relationships, especially in light of family ties that have become remote. In other words, a neighbor who is near, you know, they're close by geographically, 
that's better than a brother. They are better than a brother who is geographically far away. Now, this is really important and I think helpful and perhaps even simply a truth that people in our modern age and in our developed world need to understand because we live in an age that is filled with broken families, number one, and transplanted people, number two. You know, we so often grow up, move out, go to school, move away from our city or state or country of origin and are far from our families. And so we must realize that we cannot put the pressure from afar on our families. We need to actually find friends that are near to us in life geographically uh, to help us in the day of calamity. This is also helpful in an era where many have tried to find friendships and relationships through the digital space. And although that those can be real and can be helpful and can be wonderful, nothing can replace actually being in the presence of a friend where you are able to laugh together, cry together, speak together, and encourage one another. Be wise, verse 11, my son, and make my heart glad that I may answer him who reproaches me. Now, here the father has been teaching his son. So now he pleads his son to be wise. That's what the Proverbs are really all about. A father pleading with his son to be wisdom or to live out the teachings that he has given. And so this exhortation is basically a father pausing to say, hey, all these Proverbs, receive them. All these Proverbs, listen to them. Make my heart glad that I may answer him who reproaches me. You know, the truth is, if the pupil or the student lives out what they've been taught from the word of God, the teacher's heart is made glad. The teacher also can answer his critics, him who reproaches me, that the teaching works. He can tell his critics, look, the fruit is there. It's working in their lives. John re reiterated this kind of concept when in 2 John and also 3 John, he spoke of greatly rejoicing to find that some in the church were walking in the truth. It just brought great joy to the apostle's heart. Verse 12, the prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer for it. Now, this is a repeat of Proverbs 22, verse 3, and simply a contrast between the prudent man and the simple man. Take a man's garment, verse 13, when he has put up security for a stranger and hold it in pledge when he puts up security for an adulteress. Again, this is a repeat of a previous proverb, Proverbs 20, verse 16. It must be important. And so the concept here is that a debtor's outer garment could be taken by a creditor as collateral to guarantee that the debtor would in the future make that payment. And so it helps us understand that we must be wise and discerning in business dealings and in financial transactions. We should not be foolish. And if I could say it this way, we should not allow the charity and agape and love that is found in the body of Christ to delude us into becoming a people who are no longer discerning, no longer able to use our minds when in the financial realm. I praise God for those who are financially astute, have invested well, and have not allowed themselves to be taken of uh, advantage of financially uh, as based on or by appealing to their Christian charity and love. Verse 14, whoever blesses his neighbor with a loud voice, rising early in the morning, will be counted as cursing. Now, humor seems to be used in this proverb. But it's more than a proverb on how to wake up in the morning. Uh, you know, there are times where uh, a friend will humorously wake up up their friend with a loud voice in the morning. But here, uh, the concept isn't, hey, make sure you're quiet in the morning. Now, the concept is that timing and sensitivity and context are important parts of communication. You know, the timing here would be early in the morning. That's just not the time for a loud voice. Uh, there's, a, there's a time for it, and that's not it. 
the sensitivity would be how the vehicle the the loud voice would be how in this proverb and the context would be the neighbor uh, and early again in the morning when you consider timing and sensitivity and context it helps you to communicate better with those around you verse 15 a continual dripping on a rainy day and a quarrelsome wife are alike to restrain her is to restrain the wind or to grasp oil in one's right hand uh, again another proverb about the quarrelsome wife again this is a father warning his son and the idea here is that a quarrelsome wife is out of control uh, there's just nothing that can be done like wind or oil which cannot be grasped she cannot be brought under control so it is a warning for those who are considering marriage in their future it is also a word of empathy for those who find themselves in a marriage like this it's just basically in a sense a way of saying yeah that's a difficult reality iron verse 17 sharpens iron and one man sharpens another you see God wants to shape you with good friends good friends can bring you rest and laughter and humility and wisdom but when you have spiritually minded friends uh, you can be built up you can be sharpened iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another Paul said in 1st Thessalonians 5 verse 23 that we are constructed by God as spirit and soul and body and the reality is that you are more than just the physical you you have a soul you have a spirit and so good friends are able to speak to you about and in that spiritual dimension that that realm of the soul they can remind you of grace they can remind you of Christ likeness they can remind you of the mission um, that God is on and that you are to engage with but when you are around friends or people who are the opposite of this iron you will not be sharpened by them and so again another proverb encouraging us to choose our relationships wisely verse 18 whoever tends a fig tree will eat its fruit and he who guards his master will be honored now apparently the fig tree needs closer attention than other plants and needs nurturing and cultivation in order to develop fruit so since that is the case this proverb seeks seems to be saying don't give up on those you are called to submit to wait for the fruit to come I remember years ago reading this particular proverb when I was serving in an assistant pastor pastoral role and I sensed the spirit impressing this verse upon my heart you know tend to your master guard your master uh, minister and help and aid this pastor that you are called here to serve and if you do like the person who tends the fig tree will eat the fruit so also you will eventually be honored as in water verse 19 reflects face so the heart of man reflects the man water can serve as a mirror to reflect your face and of course they were living in an era without photography and, and mirrors and so for them water would often be the time when uh, people would actually see themselves uh, more, most clearly and so he says here so also your heart offers a true reflection of the true you as in water face reflects face so the heart of man reflects the man and this is beautiful because it's the heart of course that Jesus came to change uh, he did not he, he did come to bring us new bodies uh, that we'll receive in glory but he did not come first to deal with the new body but to deal with the heart yeah, out of the heart comes all types of sins but Christ can change the heart verse 20 Sheol and Abaddon are never satisfied and never satisfied are the eyes of man 
Uh, these words, Sheol and Abaddon, are Old Testament words for hell, and it's saying here that they are never full. Neither are the eyes of man. The, 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 we are constantly lusting. We are constantly desiring. 1 John 2, verse 16, says that all that's in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. These desires are never quenched. Verse 21, the crucible is for silver and the furnace is for gold and a man is tested by his praise. You know, the reality is that one of the deepest trials that you will ever go through are the trials of your successes. You see, when you are successful, you are incredibly tested because in those moments, the temptation will be to receive praise and to forget God. And the question is, how will you and how will I respond to success? Will financial security give us false confidence? Will career advancement become the idol that we worship? Will the discovery of the gift of the Spirit fill us with pride? Will the growth of a family cool our love for God? And will the fruitfulness in our church dry up our prayers for that church? You see, when we are successful or when things are fruitful, we so often cease to press in to the Lord. And so we are tested by our praise. Verse 22, crush a fool in a mortar with a pestle along with crushed grain, yet his folly will not depart from him. You see, grain becomes usable by crushing it with the pestle. But when the fool is crushed by his folly, well, nothing good happens. He remains a fool. Know well, verse 23, the condition of your flocks and give attention to your herds. For riches do not last forever. And does a crown endure to all generations? When the grass is gone and the new growth appears and the vegetation of the mountains is gathered, the lambs will provide your clothing and the goats the price of a field. There will be enough goat's milk for your food, for the food of your household and maintenance for your girls. Now, of course, not everyone is a literal shepherd, but all have a sphere to shepherd. And here we see lessons that are helpful to faithful stewardship. Number one, we see that we are to assess conditions. Know well the condition of your flock. We should take a look at, you know, our organization or our family or our sphere of responsibility. Number two, success is not guaranteed so do not coast. You know, he says riches do not last forever. And a crown, does it endure to all generations? It's not guaranteed. You don't know what the future holds. And number three, we learn we are to prepare for the future. These lambs will provide your clothing and the goats the price of a field. And we should work hard. There is going to be enough milk for your food and, and maintenance for your girls. The idea here is that we must be hard-working individuals. God bless you, and amen. Thank you for listening. For additional resources and teachings, or to contact us, please visit us at nateholdridge.com.